Hey guys, welcome back to Study Christ. I'm Char, and today we'll be reading Leviticus chapter 21. And this is the Jesus Bible NIV. It looks like so. But before we get into reading God's word today, of course, let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We give you all the praise, honor, glory, and praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for life. Thank you for all that you've done for me, Lord God. Thank you for all my subscribers. Thank you for all my family. Lord, thank you for loving us and keeping us throughout the night, Lord God. Thank you for discipline and self-control to get this done. Lord, we ask that you help us to learn you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, so... Whew, I'm cold, y'all, so bear with me. I've been trying to warm up for the, I don't know how long, but I got to get these videos done in Jesus' name. All right, chapter 21. And of course, I got my color of choice here today. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, a priest must not make himself ceremonially unclean for any of his people who die except for a close relative such as his mother or father, his son or daughter, his brother, or an unmarried sister who is dependent on him since he has no since she has no husband. For her, he may make himself unclean. He must not make himself unclean for people related to him by marriage and so defile himself. Priests must not shave their heads or shave off the edges of their beards or cut their bodies. They must be holy to their God and must not profane the name of their God because they have presented the food offerings to the Lord, the food of their God, they are to be holy. They must not marry women defiled by prostitution or divorce from their husbands because priests are holy to their gods. Regard them as holy because they offer up the food of your God. Consider them holy because I am holy. I who make you holy. That's it right there in a nutshell, right? <laughs> God makes us holy. It's nothing that we can do. He makes us holy and righteous. He has justified us through the Christ of blood, right? And as a act of gratitude and submission, we honor him. We give him glory and we, you know, we uh, surrender to him. And we sacrifice ourselves, a living sacrifice, out of gratitude and commitment to serving God. And, you know, because um, you can never repay him. You could never thank him enough. But appreciation is like, you know what? You've done so much for me, God. The least I can do is submit myself and sacrifice my life to you. Verse seven, they must not marry women defiled by prostitution or divorce from their husbands because priests are holy to their God. Regard them as holy because they offer up the food to your God. <coughs> excuse me. Consider them holy because I am the Lord. <coughs> excuse me, because I, the Lord am holy. I who make you holy. If a priest daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute she disgraces her father she must be burned in the fire the high priest the one among his brothers who has had the anointing oil poured on his head and who has been ordained to wear the priestly garments must not let his hair become unkempt or tear his clothes he must not enter a place where there is a dead body he must also make himself unclean he must not make himself unclean, excuse me, even for his father or mother, nor leave the sanctuary of his God or desecrate it because he has been dedicated by the anointing oil of his God. I am the Lord God. And I'm sorry, y'all, I believe I read verse seven to eight of twice, but they're saying very similar things. And that's a lot of things that kind of tripped me up in the Old Testament. It's like, did I read that? Because it says almost the same thing, but <clears throat> forgive me, y'all. Ooh, I didn't see this for uh, chapter 20. All right, I'll probably read it in this video. <clears throat> anyway, verse 13. The woman he marries must be a virgin. He must not marry a widow, a divorced woman, or a woman defiled by prostitution, but only a virgin from his own people. 
so that he will not defile his offering, offspring among his people. I am the Lord who makes him holy. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, for the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his, of his God. No man who has any defect may come near, no man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed, no man with a crippled foot or hand, or who is hunchback or a dwarf, or who has any eye defect, or who has festering or running sores or damaged testicles. No descendant of Aaron, the priest, who has any defect is to come near to present the food offering to the Lord. He has a defect. He must not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the most holy food of his God as well as the holy food. Yet because of his defect, he must not go near the curtain or approach the altar and so desecrate by sanctuary. my sanctuary. I am the Lord who makes them holy. Then verse 24. So Moses told this to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites. So Moses is still delaying messages concerning Aaron himself and obviously Israelites. All right. So we have some very sensitive subject matters here. Obviously, there's a lot of talk pretty much about disabilities. Um, we understand that disabilities then are very similar and some are still current today, modern time. And we know that we treat these people with extra care. Um like they are, what's the word I'm looking for? <clears throat> for the purpose of God and his kingdom, in most cases, um, you will find that God provides a man of good health, a man of wisdom and knowledge to take care of himself and to adhere to rules and regulations. Um, so that's kind of it in short, like someone who wouldn't have a disability or any hindrance to do the works of the priestly priesthood. In short, had to make sure they were able to carry out all the tasks because God is holy and these things are to be precise without error. And of course, if you have any type of deformity or disability, that will be either completely impossible or a hindrance. And even moderately, like if the job is to drive trucks, uh, more than likely they're not going to hire someone that doesn't have arms. Well, obviously, right? Because how are you going to steer the truck? Now, there's people who with these disabilities have learned to maneuver through everyday life, but not on a corporate or a um, bigger spectrum and obviously even bigger than corporate in the corporate world is God and God has a way of doing things and he wants them done exactly as he wants them to be done um, but again this is not to say that personally or interpersonally like in someone's home or in someone's family that people can't do these different things because people learn how to maneuver around their disabilities all the time so hopefully no one is offended about the mentioning of these individuals with these disabilities, because like I said, modernly, we still have them. Um, uh, uh, people are still born. They can't walk or can't talk, deaf, blind, um, no hands or have to get hands and fingers removed. These things, they still carry on today because these things are, um, Everything stems from sin, by the way, the fall of man, where the world was perfect and everything was in harmony and then sin disrupted that harmony. So then you have all these other things you have to worry about and deal about. But your heart posture and your mentality towards these things matter a big deal, because just because someone has a disability, you still love them the same. You still um, treat them the same. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. That was the tail end of verse or chapter 21. So now let's take a look at what was supposed to be read with Leviticus 20. But like I said, I didn't see it. Uh, punishments for sin. When parents respond to misbehavior with appropriate and measured discipline, the child is likely to think the parents are cruel and lacking grace. 
For many readers, God's plan of discipline for sinners spelled out in Leviticus 20 seems cruel, harsh, and even extreme. In most cases, all parties in the sinful activity were to be put to death by the community. The promised punishments were actually generous warnings, shedding light on God's desire that his people live and not die. His explicit commands help the people know that know what conduct to avoid. The Lord, who is always just, repeatedly noted that offenders who disregard his warning would die, but their blood would be on their own hands. The list of behaviors and consequences also served to train the Israelites to obey their God while staying away from the dark practices of other nations. God wanted them anchored to his concept yeah, of holiness before they entered the new land he was about to give them. In the New Testament, Jesus gave the community new instructions for responding to friends and family members in sin. He taught that the offender should be pursued with the goal of repentance. Jesus even outlined different scenarios and responses. Paul the Apostle instructed that churches should remove sinners claiming to be Christians if they refuse to repent from wickedness. There is evidence that death as a consequence of defiance occurred beyond the Old Testament context. Paul exclaimed to the Corinthian church that some of their people had become sick or died because they mistreated the occasion of the Lord's super Lord's Supper, I'm sorry. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we are reminded that the Lord disciplines us as a father disciplines the children he loves. God requires holiness from his people and promises to assist us in this process. He will, through our obedience and close association with him, together with occasional necessary discipline, makes his people holy. He will do this for his glory and for our good. So, in short, yes, there is punishment for sin, but we have the warning. We have the blueprint. We have the foundation right here in God's word. And in that case, God gave the message to Moses to give to the people like, okay, this is what I uh, expect from you. This is what I require of you. And if you don't do this, this is going to happen. So God gave the verbal warning. So although someone may read and say, hey, death was kind of harsh for that or exile was kind of harsh for that, please understand that God gave ample warning. He repeated the laws and decrees. He gave it to Moses to repeat them. So it's not like they didn't know the law. They refused the law and they were disobedient. And they were stiff necked people. Just like you say, your child is hard headed. It is the same concept with us as people. God has to deal with us accordingly because of the fallen man and us, we're rebellious and we're stiff necked that we don't want to always do what God needs us to do. And sometimes he has to whip us back in shape or, you know, discipline us back in line because we're hard headed, we're rebellious and we're disobedient. And all those things are breeding grounds for things to just go south. And God's no, he knows that. And we're learning that. Like it's, sometimes it takes us a little longer than others to see that, hey, if I don't do this this way, or if I avoid that, this will be the consequence of that. So God is smarter. He is greater um, than us. And he knows best for us without error. And when we hold on to that mindset, we will understand and appreciate the discipline because it would get us back on track. All right, y'all. So that was the reading of chapter 21 and the little side note here for Leviticus 20. And stay tuned because next we'll be reading Leviticus 22. All right, y'all. Love you all. God bless. Take care. Bye.